Well. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us here uh, live at the Edelman Planetarium for our Cabin Fever Astronomy event. My name is Amy Baraclaw. I am here. that uh, we have everything set the way that we want it. So uh, we appreciate your patience that we're starting had planned, um, but we'll be getting started very shortly. My mic. It actually turned on, Victor. I know it. It turned off from uh, from over there, as you see it, but it turned on because I turned on the the live view here, so it stops you from seeing it. But, which is probably something everybody can hear me saying. Hello. All right, sorry about that. Good. 
All right, so hello everybody. Uh, so my name is Ben West. I am the assistant here at the Edelman Planetarium. Sorry for some of the uh, technical difficulties there. So we have a uh, couple things set up. In the past, we have set up uh, two telescopes, each with a camera. But this time, we are trying a camera set up uh, to do wide field stuff, and another set up on a telescope. So right now, we are looking through the uh, through the camera that is set up on a telescope and give me one second for okay I think the microphone volume was a bit too loud for the people on uh, on YouTube or Facebook that but that should have fixed it so we are currently looking through the uh, telescope which is currently set up on sorry the uh, camera currently set up on a telescope I apologize and we are currently looking at the uh, moon so right now we are just past the first quarter phase of the moon when it's gone about a quarter of the way uh, around the earth after the uh, new moon phase and is about halfway lit up so we are just past halfway lit up and so what we're looking at with the moon right here is uh, two things actually we are looking at the well we actually can't quite see it with the current view we have but there's the uh, nighttime side of the moon there which if we took a longer duration photograph you'd actually be able to see some detail on and there is the lighter side of the moon there, the side facing toward the sun. So this side is often, uh, sorry, the, the, the far side of the moon, the side facing away from us, is often mistakenly called the dark side of the moon, in particular by uh, fans of Pink Floyd, um, myself being one of them, but uh, the dark side of the moon is actually the side facing away from the sun, which includes this side over there. So not the side that's facing away from the earth, which is the far side, but the side facing away from the sun. And in fact, the dark side of the moon here, the side facing away from the sun, but on the half of the moon that's uh, facing toward us, is actually slightly visible to a camera with a long enough uh, exposure length, if you're taking a, a long enough duration photograph, because just like the uh, moon reflects light toward us that we can see at night, on the nighttime side of the moon, you can actually see, depending on where you are, uh, you can actually see light being reflected off of the Earth. So just like how we receive moonshine on the moon, you can actually, actually see Earthshine. But looking at the lit up side of the moon here, uh, there are a number of things which you probably are able to pretty well see here. So first off, there are two main different brightnesses we can see on the surface of the moon. There is a brighter area, particularly over here, and a generally darker area down here. So the darker area of the moon, uh, these areas are known as the uh, maria, which means basically seas or lakes, because earlier observers of the moon thought that these looked like they might have been, well, seas or lakes on the surface of the moon. Now, today we know that is not quite the case. These are, in fact, um, volcanic plains, so areas where once lava filled up areas of the moon and uh, cooled down and hardened and formed large, very, very smooth, very flat regions on the surface of the moon that are a lot darker than the uh, other areas of the moon. And scattered throughout here, we can also see a ton of craters. So you can see a crater up here, for instance, or over there, or over there, or up here, or actually just down, actually, because uh, we have the view flipped for the video, because the telescope flips it. So I'm saying up because it's up on my screen, but down everywhere else. But there are also far larger craters, like you can see a uh, far, far, far larger crater around here, as well as kind of mountains that have formed around the rim of that crater. So there are a ton of craters on the surface of the moon because the moon, as well as the Earth, uh, was bombarded uh, a lot uh, throughout history. So a lot of asteroids and other objects have hit the surface of the moon, knocking out chunks of the surface and leaving behind craters. Uh, the Earth has had the same happen, except that the surface of the Earth is very geologically active. There's, there are changes constantly happening on the surface of the Earth that hide many of its scars, many of its craters. Whereas on the moon, there really isn't any geological activity, and so most of these craters, well, all of them, have pretty much just stuck around since they formed. So the uh, Maria here are actually incredibly smooth, and because of that, they're pretty ideal landing spots for spacecraft. For instance, the uh, many of the Apollo missions, or possibly all of them, I believe, uh, landed in the uh, or on the Maria because they're incredibly smooth. So there were fewer uh, boulders, for instance, or other hazards in the way. So another thing you'll notice here, looking at the moon, is the Terminator which is not to do with a uh, movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, but is in fact the name for the uh, dividing line between night and day on any object, but in this case on the moon. And right along the Terminator, you can see some pretty cool stuff. Like uh, what sounds like an explosion of some kind here. 
or some other loud sound like a door closing. So um, if I zoom in on this area, we're looking at a crater right along the terminator on the moon here. And as you can actually see, because this is an area that's basically right now in, uh, I guess in sunrise, because this crater has depth, um, you can actually see a shadow being cast into the crater by the uh, sun. So part of the crater is currently in shadow, and uh, part of it is also is currently being lit up by the sun. And you can actually use that uh, shadow to calculate. I think it's the building for Discovery Hall. It sounds like they're, they're putting the piling in. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. I'm going to assume that's true. So uh, you can actually determine the uh, the angle of the sun. Jeez. I can't. So, okay. <laughs> so uh, you can determine, once again, the, the angle of the uh, sun casting a shadow in there. And that's actually been used in the past to determine the distance um, uh, of the moon from the Earth before we had uh, more advanced techniques like... Um, one of the Apollo missions, I forget which one it was actually left, or maybe it might have been a couple, uh, left a series of mirrors on the surface of the moon, which astronomers nowadays can actually shine lasers off of, bounce lasers off of, to calculate the uh, distance to the moon by measuring how long it takes for that laser, uh, the light from the laser, to bounce back to the Earth. But you could actually in the past have used uh, that crater there to determine the distance to the moon. Uh, how big is that crater? I have no clue. Not a clue. But Amy, you might be able to look it up to uh, to find out if you can figure out which crater that is. I'm not sure. Um, Victor, would you be able to, to uh, on the paddle, just press down a little bit? It's starting to drift. Just tap it. Oh, actually, up, up, up. I got it backwards. And then, um, right? Nope, left. My intuition was right. Okay. So, up and left, if you could. Kind of hold left for a little bit. Stop, stop. No, wait, was that up or left? Okay, go down. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, and then just hold uh, left. Left. Cool. All right. Awesome. Sorry, he was drifting a bit, and it's like stuff is like mirrored, and, and it's always confusing. All right. Oh man, that's actually drifting a lot. We might need to realign that. But uh, hmm. No, it was drifting a bit. Anyway, I know, I know. So looking at the uh, southern part of the moon here, we can see a lot more craters. So there are fewer smoother maria. Uh, toward the south than there are toward the north. And so we can see a lot more of these craters. And we can actually see some cool detail inside of these craters. If you look at the centers of some of these craters, you can actually see a little bit of material that's jutted up from the center. And that's basically like a rebound of material from when, um, from when uh, an asteroid or whatever other object hit the surface of the moon really, really, really hard. So it liquefied a bit of the surface, and part of it came up, much like if you were to uh, watch water drop in, or drips of water go into water and kind of cause a, a ripple to come up or something to come up. You might have been able to see that in like a slow motion video at some point in the past. But you can also see that there are craters inside of some of these craters or along some of the rims. So craters have hit older craters and have kind of stacked craters on top of craters. You can also see a whole lot of distortion currently in the image. Um, because we're having a little bit of wind up here, and the wind does two things. It shakes the telescope a little bit, and uh, the moving air, the turbulent air from the wind, also slightly distorts the path of uh, light as it travels from the moon into the Earth's atmosphere and eventually to us. So the Earth's atmosphere is um, somewhere right, like 80-ish uh, er, uh, miles thick. And uh, so as light travels through that air, its path can be slightly deflected, and so it might not necessarily come straight to us, which can cause a kind of a wavy distortion that astronomers call seeing um, to the light that we see here. Uh, 
Uh, so someone asked me in uh, privately in Zoom here, what year was the moon discovered? That's really hard to say. Humans have been able to see the moon for the entirety of human history. So we really don't know who was the first to realize uh, that it was there. But um, for all intents and purposes, we've known about the moon for the entirety of human history. So I suppose it's probably... Well, I guess the sun would probably be the first thing we, I suppose, discovered in space, but then you have the moon after that. Should we uh, move off the moon and go to Mars, or...? You want to try? Sure. So that's. So Amy is going to. We're currently looking through the uh, wide field uh, camera here, and she's going to try to uh, turn it so we can see the constellation of Orion. In the meantime, I'll actually switch us back on over to the moon. If he wants Mars, he can come here and, and get it himself. telescope are we using? Uh, I believe we are using a Celestron Nexstar 6E currently. Um, although, yeah. So we have a Nikon um, D5500 hooked up to the Celestron Nexstar 6SE. I believe I, or Nexstar Evolution, or geez, I don't know. Yeah, it's, there are so many similar names. It's, it's one of those things. It's silver. <laughs> That's a good enough description. Yeah. Connect. Where are we? Uh, yeah, though, I think you're kind of out of focus. Whoops. Yeah, Amy, you'll want to refocus that. Uh, if you, if you want to just, I can tell you how in focus it is if you want, or... Uh... What'd you do? Oh, it, it, it disconnected. Stress again. Uh, okay, are you focusing? Uh, other way. Cool, that's pretty good. Awesome. All right, let's try this and just see what happens. showing you images through our telescopes. We're, we're not quite showing them to you in real time. Um, the, the live cameras that we have um, are not as sensitive as the human eye. So what we end up doing is taking uh, usually around 30 to 45 seconds exposure with our cameras. And then that's what we're projecting to you. The one exception to that is the moon. Which is definitely bright enough that we're able to show that to you live. So as we're switching over to that moment right now, through our camera, we actually have to take a longer exposure and we're going to show that in just a little bit. I've actually uh, turned us onto it. We are a little bit too zoomed in, but this might actually be kind of cool because you can see the Orion Nebula down there a little bit. 
So I took a one second photo, that's what we're seeing now, and just a second we'll update with a slightly longer duration photo. Actually, might need to go a bit uh, longer than that. Got a really good focus there, actually. I'm surprised that our weird coordination worked. If I can stop it. All right, so let's go for 30 seconds and see what happens. Might get too washed out. Yep, those are these right there. The Orion Nebula right over there. No, let's just we can go back to Mars. Alright, so we're currently uh, moving over to uh, the Orion Nebula. Um, but in the meantime, I believe Amy has zoomed us out for the constellation of Orion. So let's see how well that's looking here. No, not a whole lot. That's okay. How that's looking? I sure can. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's there. Um, you're a little hold hold right a little bit, a little bit more. Awesome. All right, let's see how that looks. So we have turned the other camera over to uh, the Orion Nebula. So in the view here, if this is the lower half of Orion, the Orion Nebula is located right down here. This is what looks like three or four stars here. And right at the center, this is what's a little bit fuzzy. And that is the Orion uh, Nebula. And so we're going to try to take some photos of that area with the telescope here. Although they will likely be very, very, very shaky because it's a little bit windy here. And also in about uh, six or seven minutes, we should actually have a uh, passing by of the International Space Station, or ISS, and we're going to try to capture that, although that there's a very good chance that won't go well. But we will see what happens. So we should have an image coming any second now of the Orion Nebula. There we go. Okay, that's very fuzzy. Probably because of all the wind. But you can see the Orion Nebula well enough now um, we're a little off to the side, actually, still. 
Victor, could you hold right a little bit? I'm going to, uh, hold on. Um, could you hold right for about a second? Maybe another couple. Yeah, that's good. All right, thanks. All right, let's try this again. How's that looking? That's a lot better, okay. So we'll go, we'll go ahead and try to take a longer duration photograph of that. In the meantime, um, we currently have the wide field camera here set up pointing roughly in the direction of Cassiopeia. So I will try to take a very quick image photo of that while we're waiting on the other camera to uh, take a longer duration photograph of the constel of uh, the Orion Nebula. So down here you can actually see a lot of light which is unfortunately you could probably also hear a train but down here all of this light is unfortunately from the great city of Philadelphia which we can see the uh, light pollution from here in uh, Glassboro. So where there are people there tend to be lights and all of the lights everybody has on their homes uh, actually bounces around a bit in the atmosphere above us and it comes back at us in what we astronomers call light pollution. And so the more people there are the worse that light pollution is. And Philly has a lot of people. So I'm not sure if a uh, longer duration photo will actually do us all that much good, but go into live view for ISS. I was thinking, drop the IS, so, uh, yeah, drop the well, I was about to, yeah. Oh, that would be cool. I'm not sure if we wanted the. Yeah, because I mean, we're not going to be able to, to track its motion. Okay, well, let's see. I have, I have it set to five seconds. I'll see how low of an ISO I can go. Yeah. So let's see. This is uh, five seconds. How's it going to come out? Oh, the same. Okay. Uh, what if I switch that? What's the minimum ISO? You can go 50? Yeah, 100. That is indeed the case. So we can't get a very long duration photo. This Philly is far too bright. Ah, did not mean to do that. <laughs> so, looking back at the Orion Nebula for just a second here, let's see how much I can. Uh, yeah, so there are two ways I can visualize this here. I can stretch the uh, the image quite a bit, and there's a lot of detail you can see when I stretch this to kind of remove a bit of the background. It takes on a green tint, and that's in part because uh, cameras have about twice as many sensors for green as they do for red and blue. Uh, so it, putting the green aside, ignoring the green here, you can see a lot of the uh, detail of the Orion Nebula, so just some finer, kind of redder areas here. Uh, a lot of the red in the Orion Nebula is coming from a an element called hydrogen, in particular a color from hydrogen called H-alpha, um, which is a decently deep red. Is the ISS coming up? Yeah, in a minute. In a minute. Yeah, All right. Then I will switch us back on over. About a minute, the ISS should start rising, and we're hoping to, to catch it. It's moving too quickly for us to uh, be able to show it to you live through the camera. 
um, but what we're hoping to be able to do is uh, catch it uh, as a, a bright streak moving across uh, your, your view. So uh, we should be seeing that very, very soon. But for anybody else uh, right now, if you see this zigzag constellation right there, a group of stars, that group of stars is known as Cassiopeia, who is uh, in Greek mythology a uh, queen sitting there in her chair, although she looks more like a uh, mountains or a W or a lightning bolt. And um, totally not stalling, waiting for. Is that it over there? I don't see it. It should be passing straight through Cassiopeia. Which way? Left, going left or right? Because I see it, that dot over there. I'm not sure if that's. It doesn't look like it's flashing right in the street that way. That looks about the right height, altitude. This, okay, look at my screen. You see that streak right here? That streak? Yeah, I think that's an airplane. You think that's an airplane? Is it going right through? The north. Um, well, I don't see it. It's 8:45. When we do see it, it's a minus one magnitude, so it's incredibly bright. For everybody else, minus one is very bright. One is dimmer than that. Um, astronomers use an inverted scale, so the more negative it is, uh, the brighter it is. I don't see it. You sure that wasn't it? I mean, the timing sounds about right. And it's it's 8.46 now. There's a streak. There's a streak there, which is something. It's pretty slow. I mean, that looks like it could be. Well, no, I mean, it should be passed by now. It was a fast pass. It was a fast low pass that was going to take two minutes from rise to set. It was not going to be easy to catch, and I don't think that we did it. Huh. I don't even think that I saw it. I don't think I did either. Because your the thing you saw is still, still moving across the sky. This is true. <laughs> uh, huh. Let's see if we can look up a... Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't think that uh, we were able to catch it. I don't know if it's because uh, the lights from Philadelphia were too bright that we just weren't able to spot it, or, or maybe... Actually, we were. That was it. Yes. That was it. It wasn't a super bright pass. <laughs> that was it. I. It's gone. No, I don't. Well, I do somewhere. For just a little bit. That was it. <laughs> I told you. Yes, so we have switched back over to that, and actually, Amy, if you could man the helm here, I'm going to go get a gloves from inside, because I'm cold. This is 
is that sort of fuzzy object that, that we were able to, to view um, from uh, just below the, the constellation of Orion when we were looking at that. It was that fuzzy object below the three stars of the belt. So this is a region where new stars are being born. Um, and you can see some uh, sort of gas and dust there. That is uh, where these new stars are actually forming. They're, they're slowly collapsing down and condensing, forming uh, new stars. And we can see a few of those bright new stars as well. So, um, so um, those of you that are, are joining us um, on Zoom, you can also feel free to um, unmute yourselves and, and ask any questions that you might have or, or type them in, our, in the chat. Um, we are monitoring the chat on um, all of the sites trying to, to answer as many of the questions that we see, so feel free to do that um, during the, the presentation today. So one of the great things about uh, doing our presentations here uh, using uh, the cameras is that we can actually get a little bit more detail than you would be able to see uh, normally when you're looking at these objects through the telescopes with your eye. Our eyes aren't very able to uh, detect the colors of these objects. So when we're looking at the Orion Nebula um, here on our, our screens, you can see that the camera was able to pick up some purples and, and reds. Uh, Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> a little chilly. It's a little bit cold for having your hands out um, to, to uh, type on the keyboard and uh, set up the telescope. So we ran inside, or Ben ran inside for a second to grab these for everybody. So. <laughs> We're a little bit distracted right now, trying to warm our fingers, fingers up just a little bit. So feel free to um, take the time to, to ask these questions. Uh, yeah. Hey, Victor. Um, so, um, actually, we're going to be our view in just a second, um, switching over uh, from the Orion Nebula to, to take a look at um, Mars. I know that we've had a few requests uh, to view that this evening. So we will uh, be doing that in, in just one second. And uh, the, the telescope, I guess, has been drifting just a little bit. So uh, they're going to take just a few seconds to, to realign um, the, the telescopes before we do that. So. <laughs> So um, since we're just waiting while they realign uh, the telescopes and get us uh, set to Mars, does anybody have any uh, questions uh, about that we can answer about 
um, what we've seen or, or you know what we're what we're doing or just anything in general, please uh, feel free to take this opportunity to to ask those. We're happy to answer as many questions as we can. We're using this this opportunity um, to to train our students. Normally, when we do these um, observatory open houses, we have uh, students from the physics and astronomy club out uh, to help us. When they're in person, we're setting up multiple telescopes all over um, so that we can have as many different things pointed out um, as we possibly can. Uh, and we have the the students to help man those. Well since we're not in person, we're limiting the number of telescopes that we have set out at one time. So we're also limiting the number of students up here as well. So uh, Victor is uh, just learning how to use these telescopes today. So um, you'll have to forgive us for occasionally needing to uh, step away from the, the camera and help uh, reset uh, the telescopes and get them aligned on the different objects. We're, we're using this as a training opportunity uh, for the students as well as a learning opportunity uh, for all of you watching at home. <laughs> Victor, uh, Dr. Klassen says, go Victor. <laughs> He's cheering you on. <laughs> Uh, so somebody else uh, asked how our stars formed in the nebula. So um, stars are, are all formed um, by gravity in these nebulas. So these nebulas are, are huge clouds of gas and dust. And uh, this dust is, is slowly condensing down because of gravity um, and, and forming little pockets where new stars and planets are formed. Somebody uh, on YouTube asked a very similar question of how are stars born. So they're, they are born um, in these, these uh, nebula, these clouds of gas and dust, like uh, the Orion Nebula, which is sometimes called a stellar nursery because this is where uh, new stars are being formed. Do they send these laser beamed Mars also? Um, not that I am aware of, Craig. We don't send any laser beams there, but we do send radio beams. Okay, so, uh, yeah, there, there are no laser beams, um, but we do send uh, radio signals uh, to Mars. That way we can communicate with the uh, spacecraft and uh, rovers we have over there, or rather we communicate with the spacecraft orbiting around Mars, which can in, uh, in turn, some of them, a couple of them, uh, repeat a signal to any or any sorry rovers on the surface or any landers on the surface as well, like the InSight lander or the uh, Opportunity, sorry not Opportunity, Curiosity and uh, Perseverance rovers. Not Oppie anymore, Oppie's gone. We might be able to get a longer duration exposure here of uh, Mars, although it'll look bad, but let's go for one four hundredth of a second. See how that turns out. Very fuzzy. Brighter, but fuzzy. Yeah, so we, um, we're, we're trying to get the best view of Mars that we can possibly get right now. Um, I think it's about it. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get very much detail. That's in part because of uh, the wind and the viewing conditions that we have here up on the observatory today. Um, but also just because Mars is uh, heading away from us. Mars has an orbit that is about uh, twice as long as the Earth's. It takes almost two Earth years for Mars uh, to complete one orbit around the Sun. So currently, uh, as it is in its orbit around the Sun, it is getting farther away from Earth each night, which makes it more and more difficult uh, to see detail on the planet. 
Uh, this past fall, Mars was actually reasonably close to us, um, close enough that we were even able to see uh, features like the uh, ice caps and, and some other uh, darker features, which we call albedo features, uh, on, on the surface of Mars. Right. Right. So. So. So I've instead, we've instead, uh, well, Victor here has instead uh, slewed us or turned the telescope over to a uh, star cluster in the constellation of Canis Major with the bright star of Sirius. And assuming it's in the frame, we should be able to see it. I believe the star cluster is called the Beehive Cluster, but please nobody quote me on that, even though I know now it's on a recording. So let's see if it's in the frame here. Uh, it is not. Oh. Boy. Oh, it is! We're just out of focus. Actually, we're really out of focus. I'm gonna see if I can refocus that. At all. Uh. Ah. So, uh, somebody typed into the chat um, our, our reopening plans for the public. Um, unfortunately, the planetarium is not likely to be reopening to the public until September. Um, this is despite the fact that Rowan University has started uh, to relax some of its uh, restrictions due to the pandemic. Uh, they are allowing uh, more in-person events to take place, but uh, in a handful of weeks, as soon as the semester is over, Science Hall, where we're located, is going to be undergoing um, some very needed, uh, very long overdue <laughs> repairs uh, to the roof. And uh, those are going to be just too disruptive uh, to any events in person. So uh, we will remain shut down to in-person events throughout the summer uh, while those repairs take place. And we will just look forward to having everybody back, hopefully uh, in September, uh, for shows and uh, virtual or uh, and for for open houses um, as well in person. So. Um, we appreciate everybody's patience uh, while we remain closed, but, you know, we are still doing lots of fun things like these virtual open houses, and we can do virtual uh, shows for school groups and private groups as well. So there's still lots of fun that we can have um, virtually, and we'll just look forward to seeing everybody in September, hopefully, when we reopen. So uh, right now, you can see that they are uh, looking at the beehive cluster here. Um, it is a little bit out of focus, so uh, we're currently trying to get that image a bit more in focus. Um, and, and then we'll uh, be able to talk about that. So are, are there any questions, any more questions um, from anybody while we're waiting to get our, our telescope uh, focused here. So we should have it uh, in focus pretty soon. Uh, the, the cluster that we are looking at um, is in uh, the constellation of uh, Cancer the Crab. Yeah, isn't it? The Beehive Cluster is in oh. Cancer. And what's the one, what's M41? M41, is that what you're looking at? Because yeah. uh, the Beehive is M44. Yeah, M41. 
Okay. See, that's why I said don't quote me on it. <laughs> All right. So uh, Ben has misled me here. Um, don't quote me on it. <laughs> so he actually uh, set the telescope on uh, M41, which is in Canis Major, the big dog. And uh, it is a star cluster, so we can see uh, thousands of stars here in our view. These are all gravitationally bound to each other, so they're all very, very close to each other, not just um, how we see them on Earth, but they are actually physically rather close together um, and um, all attached to each other moving through the Milky Way. Oh yeah, that, it doesn't have a name outside of Messier 41, does it? Right. See, I told you not to quote me on it. And here you were, quoting me on it, using it. <laughs> told you. What? M44 has two names, and M41 doesn't have any. That's mean. Precipe? Precipe? I don't know how to pronounce that. It has... What was that? Yeah. I was wrong at least three times. I'm I'm often wrong. That's why I often Google things, because it's always great to check. the wrong camera. It yeah, it connected to... What did it... Why is it doing that? Well, then what was this connected to? <laughs> How did that happen? Oh, no. <laughs> They've both taken control of the same camera? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That's not right. Work, darn you. No, you're not connected to the D5500. I know you're not connected to the D5500, because that's not what it's looking at. So we are using yeah. a, a piece of software here to control uh, both of the cameras. Uh, and the cameras that we have are very similar models. Uh, so the software is confused. Yeah, the software is confused. And we now think that both of the cameras um, are... Uh, the, the same model, even though they're not. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> two of you are using that same camera instead of the same camera. Oh my gosh, no. Right now, we are currently um, at Cassiopeia again, sort of, and also oh. the lovely lights of Philadelphia. I unplugged it. Well, um, I forgot to plug it back in. Tried to get everything set up, so uh, I think that helps, right? when we were uh, trying to get everything this helps, right? focused, uh, we're looking at M41, uh, huh. the, the lights got a little bit confused, and uh, two lights to the same camera instead of one to the individual camera. <laughs> Uh, okay, we'll try that one again. We're pointing in the right place now. Yes, we are. Okay. Cool. 
We're hooked up right. That's great. So, Amy, I have no idea how you control that. If you want to try, we can try for the little different to see what happens. Is that is that Andromeda? Hey, that's a star cluster right there. Victor, put it to M44. <laughs> I was trying to signal, but you're just like giving me other signs back. <laughs> I thought you put a 2 in there. It never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. Someone told us, oh, blue, jeez, put the pointy things in the outlet. Everything's plugged in, except for the camera, which wasn't. Turn up the desktop audio. Um, I can, I can try. Uh, hmm. See what happens there. Will that fix anything? Um, Amy, could you try to speak again through your microphone? Just see what happens. That you're too quiet. Yeah, you still are. I can see that. I think it's just capture capturing it in a weird way. Limiter. I'll just make you louder. <laughs> like this. So. 10 decibels is probably too much. Hopefully, this is a, a little bit better without uh, being a little, uh, without being too loud. Could someone in and Facebook or YouTube just tell us whether or not that's uh, a bit louder? <laughs> Amy, if you could just continually speak. If I could just continually speak. Just never stop, yeah. Um, like forever. Yeah, that that seems pretty awkward, but I'll see what I can do. Um, I mean, you could, just, you could just, like, like keep up. You could just say, like, blah, or something like that. I don't know. All right, okay, so Dave, it, it is, uh, Dr. Klassen yeah, says it's better. Yeah. Um, I can make it better, -er, but... Well, why don't we uh, switch over and see if we can see the little dipper now. Yes, yeah, we can try that, sure. pointed it over there. Yes. We kind of can... Kind of can't. I zoomed in too much. I have two options for zoom. Why do I only have two? Okay. Well, it's very faint, but you can see Polaris, the North Star, right here. You can actually also see the Big Dipper. We barely <laughs> pointing it out with a finger. We barely fit the whole Big Dipper in here, but you can see the Big Dipper right there. Take these two stars and the Big Dipper, follow them straight down, and right there, right there, we have the North Star Polaris, which is the last star in the tail of the uh, Little Dipper, or Ursa Minor, or the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper. So we have the uh, Little Bear, Ursa Minor, or Little Dipper, and so that's the last star in the uh, tail, or handle. Two more stars there, and then we have four stars and a blinky plane. 
Uh, uh, but two stars two here, here that are brighter in the little dipper, and then two very, very, very faint ones, and these two. And again, the plane. That's the, uh, the plane constellation. It's a straight line. Uh, astronomers are not a fan of that constellation. Thankfully, it's one of the rare constellations that moves away and couldn't do so faster. Uh, hmm. What if we... How far can you zoom that in? Not uh, pretty far. You want to try to put it on, um... It might be a little hard, but on, uh, Mizar and Alcor? Uh, sure. I'm not sure how well it'll work, but... Uh, let's uh, wait a second. It's five seconds between shots. Um, no. You can go off to the right. It might help if I just allow you to like look through it yourself. Yeah, I have enabled your ability to use your camera yourself. <laughs> You're welcome. So we are back on the actual beehive cluster now. Um, I, I totally uh, intended to put us there in the first place. So thank you, Victor, for moving it over there. Uh, hmm. Actually, now that I think about it, This is a long shot. Uh, Victor, if you want to put in M81, this is very much a long shot, but uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to see it or not. The moon's far enough away. That was, light pollution's still pretty bad. We'll see what happens. So we're, I'm gonna, or Victor here is, is turning the, the uh, telescope, assuming it's going to line up right. Uh, you're fine, you don't need to worry. It's, it's pointed very much above your head, Victor. You're good. You don't need to lean over. Um, so we're, we're going to try to point it at um, Messier object number 81, also known as Bode's Galaxy. And there's a good chance we won't be able to see it, but if we can, then that would be cool, too. How's it looking, Amy? You don't see, think what? Okay. Um, let me know when to switch it over. Yeah. Here, I'm gonna before you like loop, before you tighten it, try that. I probably need to adjust both. Uh. Yeah, actually, if you can zoom out. Zoom out more? More? More. Like more. More? Oh wait. Hold on, let me let me try this a different one again. Oh, I think we have, uh, yeah, we have, we have Mizar, or no, Alcor, and Mizar, or maybe it's backwards, I don't know, it's one of the two, I mean, I am, such a good chance. I am set at about, uh, what our eyes can see right now, I am not seeing the Dipper at huh. so I think you are looking at two stars of the Dipper. That is entirely possible. Yes, I am, you're right. Yeah, yeah, okay, so that, that down there is my- Oh, you were zoomed in, you were zoomed in on the, um, the uppermost of the three stars in the handle. I was like, where's Alcor? So yeah, over here we have Mizar, and down there we have Alcor. So Mizar and Alcor- oh wait, are we actually pointed at- Oh no. Yes. We did. Um. Okay, so. Messier 81 might be a bust. I think we might need to realign the telescope to the Big Dipper. 
Um, well, that's cool. I don't know what you did, Amy, but that actually looks really cool if you want to take a peek real quick. <laughs> it, was, it was cool looking. I don't think it was right, but it was cool. Alright, let's see. I don't know. Um, the, uh, yeah. If you can go to the left just a smidge. Uh, if I turn off the light, actually, like, see. That might help you. Um, okay. So, give us one second here, sorry. Photography of the area. Yeah. So, um, we're trying to, to set both the, the telescope and also uh, the, the uh, wider angle camera to the, the middle star in the handle of the Big Dipper. Uh, it is actually a binary star. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to see if we can show you the, the two stars. These are, are two stars that are in orbit around each other. Um, I don't think that my zoom is quite enough to be able to uh, show that from the camera, but we should be able to see it through the telescope. Oh, you're not trying to look at... Oh, you're still looking at M81? Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> so, um, I guess I was mistaken. I, I knew that they were uh, trying to, to set it over to Mizar, but I think that's on their way to finding um, the Bode's Galaxy M81. Wait, wait, wait. So we're trying to align the telescope, um, which is to say that it has a computer on board and motors, and it um, it uh, has a rough idea of how it's pointing based on counting how many rotations of the motor it does, or how many partial rotations, rather. So it keeps track of a fraction of a rotation. Um, nothing right now. Uh, if you can go to the right. Am I? Yes, that's mine. Sure is. Shouldn't be. Oh no, are we doing this again? Yep. Yes, because you disconnected it. Yep. yep. Why you do this, computer? I trusted you. We need to, to reconnect. I broke it all again. Okay, okay. sweet. So, um, if we're looking at the right one, if we're not, there we go. So if you're looking here, the two really close together that you see are Mizar, which is a binary star. And so you have two stars close together orbiting each other. Except that Mizar is actually not a binary, it's a double binary, which means each of, each of the stars that we see here is actually itself two stars that are orbiting each other. So we have two co-orbiting pairs of stars, a total of four stars together in one star system. 
And then the other brighter one we see over here is Alcor, which, as it turns out, is a binary star. So this is two stars orbiting each other. This is two pairs of two stars orbiting each other. So this is a double binary. This is a binary. And Mizar and Alcor are very, very, very close together. So close that if your eyesight isn't all that great, they blur together. And uh, so these two stars are known as a double star. So we have a very confusing name, a binary star, where two stars are close together physically in orbit each other. And then we have a double star, where two stars are not physically close together, they just line up from our perspective here on Earth, very close together. And so we have a double of Mizar and Alcor, wherein Mizar is a double binary, and Alcor is a double. So we have a double of a binary and a double binary, a double of a double binary and a binary. It's very fun. Anyway. So, so. Um. it's going to be a good buggy that I just want to get that for you. So, what you're going to do is get the double one from the center. Um, just realize that centering to a binary is a terrible idea. So, let's we'll flip this little switch that we'll do. Okay, so you should be able to get there and see. So I think that um, getting M81, if we can get it, is probably going to be the, the last thing that uh, we'll take a look at tonight. It is getting um, a little bit late. I know that we started a bit late because of uh, some technical issues with uh, getting all of our, our cameras and telescopes set up. So I appreciate everybody uh, that stuck around and waited for us to get started about uh, 15 minutes later than uh, we had planned. And I uh, hope that you have all enjoyed our, our night of stargazing here. So we'll, we'll give Ben and Victor just a, a few minutes uh, to try to get that galaxy uh, in the telescope. But um, it will be a little bit tricky uh, for us to view it because of all of the, the lights that are uh, on here at Rowan University and also just uh, we're, we're pointed uh, in the direction of uh, Philly as well. So um, it might be a little too difficult for us to get it in view, but uh, we'll give them a few minutes to try that one last thing. While we're waiting, um, please feel free to, to ask any questions that, that you have. Um, we're, we're monitoring the chat and those of you joining us on Zoom are, are welcome to unmute yourselves. Um, and and ask any questions you have. Or M eighty one. Oh, hey, oh, Keith. Keith is here. Yes. Hi, Keith. Hi, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you um, unfamiliar with uh, Keith, he is um, our predecessor from the Planetarium, the Planetarium's previous previous director. Uh, he has joined us on uh, Zoom today, <laughs> and uh, Ben apparently did not notice that before. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, Amy, Amy, did you get, you get the, the question in the chat on YouTube how hot the sun is? Uh, well, that okay. just showed up. Okay, okay. so <laughs> the sun, the surface of the sun is about uh, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or about uh, 5,500 degrees Celsius, or about 5,800 Kelvin, if you like to measure it, Kelvin, which really seems to do. Um, so that's quite hot. But it's nowhere near as hot as the core, which is many millions of degrees. But uh, the surface is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. What are, what you, are seeing you seeing now, now for someone who is currently in zooming in? Uh, not a whole lot of them, So, let's see if I can switch us over back to... Ooh, it's connected, is it? I think the gears might be messed up, I mean. 
Is your camera? Yeah. Oh, good. It is. It is. <sighs> so we, uh, we're, we're trying to, uh, set the telescopes, uh, for those of you that, that just joined us, we're trying to get our telescope set to, uh, M81, which is Bode's Galaxy. Um, it is a very faint galaxy on um, towards the uh, north part of the sky, which for us here in Glassboro means that it is pretty close to the field line, the athletic field, and um, also where we see lots of uh, light pollution from the city of Philadelphia. So we may not be able to see it, but um, we're, we're currently trying to get it set up. And uh, what you're seeing uh, on the, the view is actually just uh, a couple of, of stars <laughs> uh, that look a little bit blurry probably from uh, the wind or perhaps uh, since we are adjusting the, the cameras and telescopes, uh, trying to get them pointed, the, the camera might have taken that image uh, while the, the camera telescope was moving and so uh, it, it ends up creating a, a bit of a streak that you can see um, in the image. So we're, we're, we're trying just for this one last thing for the evening, uh, hoping to, to get that galaxy. So we'll, we'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, and if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to type those uh, in or uh, those few of you that are, are joining us still from Zoom can, can just ask them out loud. Restarted it. Technology fights us half the time I use it. I don't know why. Huh. Is your where is your camera pointed at? Your camera's just seeing black. Yeah, I, I don't huh. think that you're going to be able to... Well, darn. Our tracking <laughs> is really bad. That's okay. I think this fuzzy thing might be the galaxy. Um, but we're not going to get a picture of it. It's going to take a long time to, to align the telescope again. So It was worth a shot. <laughs> Yeah, it was a long shot to be able to, it was. to try to see it um, in the first place, and and I just I don't think that the viewing conditions um, for us tonight are ideal for for catching that galaxy. So um, sorry that it was kind of an anticlimactic end, <laughs> but I'd like to thank everybody uh, who who came out and and uh, joined us this evening and. Uh, we look forward to, to seeing everybody um, in person when we can um, join, hopefully, back in September. So enjoy your evening, everybody. Thank you again for, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.